And it's westering home, and it's goodbye to care. Laughter and love and a welcoming there. I love my heart, my own one. Where are the folks like the folks of the West? Donald and Bessie at Lafroig are the best. There I will hide me, and there I will rest. At home with my own folk on Isla. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Lafroig, let me bid you all Kid Millie Felcher, that's Gaelic, for 100,000 welcomes. My name is Simon Brookham, Lafroy, an Ardmore Master Ambassador. My mission is to spread world peace through whiskey, one dram at a time. <laughs> and uh, I think we're putting a sizable dent in the peace process here today at Whiskies of the World, yes. Um, so uh, we're, uh, I wanted to start and bring you over to Isla as much as we can, and that's why I started with the peat. Because if you, uh, if you, if you come over to Isla, um, a lot of times you come by sea, uh, and certainly, hopefully the seas won't be this rough. Uh, but they can be many a time, um, and if, uh, if you come over by the ferry and you come along the south coast of, of Isla, a lot of times you'll smell the peat before you actually start seeing the distilleries. Uh, but then uh, Ardbeg will come into view, and then you'll see Lagavulin, and then there will be Lafroig. Come into Port Ellen, get off the ferry, uh, take the first right and the next left, half a mile down the road you'll arrive at Lafroig. Um, and here is, uh, I always like to put this shot up here because um, I think it's very indicative. This is Lafroig on the one sunny day of the year. Um, <laughs> so keep that in mind, those seeds, they're rough. Uh, and so why do we drink the whiskey? Because of that shot there. Uh, it, is, it is rough, it is tough to get on and off the island. Uh, today we've got ferries and, and, uh, and flights, two flights a day. Um, 20 minutes from Glasgow, if the plane can land, just be warned. Um, a lot of times you end up back at the airport again. Um, but, uh, but this is a, a typical day on, on Isla. Uh, just to give you some basics, yeah. Did you guys get snow there? Uh, no, we get, very little, we get very little snow on Isla. We got snow a couple of weeks ago, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't that heavy. And uh, the, because of the, the, Isla, the island of Isla is right along the Gulf Stream. So you'll see photographs of palm trees on Isla, and that's because you get the influence of the Gulf Stream comes right up along the, uh, the Outer Hebrides there, and it leads to a very uh, uh, much milder climate in comparison to uh, in the highlands where you're getting you know, 30, 40 centimeters of, of snow at times. But just to give you some basics for those of you who might be uh, joining us uh, at the Whiskies of the World for the first time, uh, here's... Uh, well, what is a single malt scotch? Well, it's a distilled product made from a scarified and fermented cereal extract implemented only by the enzymes of malted barley. Phew, don't need to know that. But what you do need to know is it has to be made in Scotland. It has to be made out of pure malted barley. That's the only grain to be used. Distilled at one distillery in a copper pot still and then aged in oak barrels for a minimum of three years by law before it can legally be called a single malt scotch. Lafroig. Lagavulin, just down the road from us, Macallan, Glenlivet, Glenfiddich, those are all single malts. The next one would be a blended scotch, and a blend is a blend of different single malts uh, from all the different distilleries from all over Scotland, plus a neutral grain alcohol. Um, back in the early 1800s, most of the whiskies were coming from the stills and going to market at anywhere from 160 to 180 proof. Now, that's just the way I like it, but for a lot of folks, that's a wee bit too hot. So a lot of the shopkeepers at the time uh, they were blending teas for their customers. So what they thought they could do is blend these different single malts coming from the different distillers, blend them together, and then add into that a neutral grain uh, spirit, which is made out of a corn wheat mix. Single malt whiskey is made one batch at a time. So uh, a ton of grain will go through the system and yield about 440 liters of spirit, and then we make the next batch. But an Irishman by the name of Aeneas Coffey uh, developed a new kind of a still called a column still, which is used, uh, practiced uh, here in America in the bourbon industry. The column stills uh, where what you, with platelets, very tall stills, and what you do is you shovel the grain in and you're able to produce uh, a neutral grain spirit 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks out of the year. So the, uh, the blenders, uh, the, the shopkeepers saw this as a way of bringing all those different single malts together and making it more homogenous for the general public. When Scotch really came into its own was the 1880s. The drink of fashion was brandy and soda. But there was a beetle, the phylloxera beetle, that killed all the rootstock, the vineyards of France. So there were no grapes available, so there was no brandy available. So that's when Scotch and soda became the drink of fashion. And because the British Empire at that point stretched throughout the world, that's when Scotch really took off. Um, 
The third distinction would be myself. I am a Scot. I'm a member of the Robertson clan. I trace my roots back to the 13th century, the Celtic Earls of Athol. The kilt that I'm wearing is the ancient hunting colors for the Robertsons. This is the whole nine yards. When you talk about the whole nine yards, you talk about a kilt. It's nine yards material. That's where the term the whole nine yards comes from. Uh, now, as I travel about uh, North America, there's always one question that seems to arise about the kilt. How we wear the kilt. You know the question, right? What, what are we wearing? Okay. So I'm going to answer it right now. Here, settle all bets with a story. So young Angus is set to be married. He goes to the local kilt maker to have a kilt made. The kilt maker says, oh yes, I've got your family tartan for you. I make a nice nine yard kilt for you. But, oh, I got 10 yards. And we Scots are rather thrifty. We're born with deep pockets and short arms, always looking to save a penny. So the kilt maker says, I'll tell you what to do. I'll make a nice scarf for your lovely Fiona, your bride to be. Keep it warm in those long, cold winter months. Perfect. So the day before the wedding, he goes to pick up the kilt. It's a bonny kilt. He's so excited, he decides he wants to show the lovely Fiona. So he puts the kilt on, puts his coat on, goes running through the barley fields, not realizing that he loses his kilt along the way. Gets to a door, knocks on the door, opens his jacket wide open. She opens the door wide open. He says, well, what do you think? She says, oh my God, it's more beautiful than I ever thought it would be. <laughs> but wait, wait, that's not the best part. The best part is I've got an extra yard you can wrap around your neck. <laughs> Meanwhile... Back in Scotland, well, actually, Ireland, uh, it was the Irish monks that were developing the, the, the distillation techniques. What they were, during the time of the alchemists, they were experimenting with different natural products. And what they found, the barley was naturally fermenting in the field. When you then boil that fermented barley, the liquid that it produced, when they drank it, it created this rather ethereal effect. It, in essence, brought them closer to their god. So when we talk about spirits in its original context, it is those religious origins. And as I started to travel, one of the first countries I came to was Ireland. On that one sunny day, from our distiller, you can look south and see Ballycastle, Ireland, 35 miles away. It is that close to, uh, to Isla. And so we share a lot with our Celtic brethren to the south, um, and they have shared a lot with us. So uh, those distillation techniques, we then, uh, for the next 700 years, we perfected those techniques. The early re earliest record we have for Scotch whiskey is 1494. We have a document with a friar, John Corr, purchasing eight bowls of malt to make acavite. Scotch whiskey is an acavite, it's the water of life. And the Gallic word for that is ushkaveha, ushka meaning water, and veha of life. Over the years, it was shortened from ushkaveha just to ushka, and then anglicized ushka morphed, ushka whiskey into whiskey. And that's where that comes from. So when you're ordering whiskey, you're actually ordering water in the Gallic language. Uh, 1505, the Guild of Surgeon Barbers in Edinburgh were granted a monopoly to produce and sell Ushkavea as a tonic. So that's when it went from the religious to the commercial. 1642, because of the English Civil War, the Scottish Parliament levied taxes on all the whiskeymen, and this drove them mad, and it drove them up into the hills and out to the islands. And that's why we have such a high concentration of distilleries in the highlands as well as on the islands today. Because on the island of Isla, where we make Lafroy, you can see the tax man coming from miles away. So you can hide those extra stills where you're making a few extra pennies on the side. By 1823, there were uh, over 17,000 illegal stills all over Scotland, looking a lot like one of these here, what we call a small still. Basically, you heat from down below. You've got your liquid here, your beer, and then the vapors will travel up over the swan neck into a condenser coil and a bucket of cold water, and then you're going to draw off your new spirit from the tap here. Pretty easy to do. Pretty hard to do consistently. We've been doing it legally at Lafroy since 1825. Uh, but I'd like to show you this because the basic design hasn't changed over years. What has changed is the size to deal with the demand and popularity for single malt scotches. And here you see the stills, what we like to call the Magnificent Seven uh, at Lafroy. Uh, first step of the distillation, these are the wash stills and these are the four spirit stills. Here you have Scotland, uh, smaller than the state of Kentucky. Kentucky has 10 distilleries. We have 94 distilleries in Scotland, so score one for Scotland on that. Um, but varies from region to region. The lowland whiskey is very light in style, grain, grassy notes. Whiskeys like Auchintosh and Glenkinchy are example of your lowland malts. A lot of calcium carbonate in the water down here, a lot of chalk, so it's a very dry whiskey. Once you taste it, the taste is gone almost immediately. Then you go north of the highlands, uh, and the highland style, more floral honey notes. Uh, we also represent our sister distillery, Ardmore, which is a peated Highland whiskey. Comes just, uh, just outside of the Speyside region. So the floral honey notes with a little bit of smoke with Ardmore. And then the, the heart of whiskey making is in the Speyside. About 45 of the 96 distilleries are in this region. Many of them beside the River Spey, hence the name Speyside. The Speysides are more herbal in their style in comparison to the Highland style. And then you've got the islands. Up to the north here in the Orkneys, you've got uh, Highland Park and Scapa. The Isle of Skye here, you've got Talisker, 
But it's this tiny wee island down here. This is where we're going to visit today, the island of Isla. 3,000 people, eight distilleries. It's also known as the Happy Island. Uh, we make a lot of whiskey on Isla, and that's where you find the beautiful hollow by the broad bay. That's what Lafroig means. Isla is another Gallic word. It means the island of island. They were very simple folk back then. They didn't be around the bush. But it's a great way to remember the region because a lot of folks say to me, Simon, is it Islay? Is it Isla? Just remember, Isla means island, and you've got the pronunciation of the region. Or I'll have another Lafroig. <laughs> All right? So let's go there, shall we? Um, but how do we make the whiskey? We start with the barley. That's the soul of the spirit. Farmers would have extra grain at the end of the season, more profitable, more economical for, the, for them to make a whiskey out of this rather than store it and lose it to the mold and the mildew of the cold, damp winter months. Plus, it gave them another commodity to sell at market, and it gave them a nice whiskey to keep them warm during those long, cold winter months. But we need to coax that spirit out of the barley. How will we do that? Well, we're one of five distilleries that, um, that does floor maltings. We're going to soak barley, seven tons of it, in the floor above this floor, start the germination, and then drop it onto this floor, and then let it grow for six days. By the end of six days, it's got the consistency of sprouts. You can see little rootlets at the ends of these. So then what we need to do is we need to stop this barley from growing. So we shovel it all into a room about 20 by 20, and then from down below, we need a fuel source. And what's our fuel source? Peat, right? What do you call a 2,000-year-old Scott? Peat. That's right, right there. So, sorry, it's not getting any better. There, that. <laughs> so you can see this is a marshy, swampy area. There are peat bogs all over the world. Uh, largest ones are in Finland, but uh, uh, all across Scotland, we've got, uh, we've got peat in the highlands and peat on Isla. Well, so how does that come into play? Well, uh, uh, that's not Pete, that's Callum. Um, he's one of our peat cutters. Um, we're going to cut the top nine inches and then dig down to another 18 inches. And we're going to take this section out and then another 18 inches below that. Now, the lower you get, the hotter you get, the fire is. But um, the, that middle section, that, that section that we were showing you there, that's the smokier fire. And that's what we use to dry the barley at Lafroig. We cut it up out of, the, uh, out of the earth using special spades and stack it, right? Um, and leave it out to cure. And by the fall, it's dried enough to be able to use to heat your homes, to cook with. But most importantly for us, for drying the barley. So now the barley has been shoveled into a chute that puts it into the kilns. And now for the next 15 to 18 hours, we're going uh, we're gonna to dry the barley over the peat fires. Now there, is, uh, there are cups of barley on every table. What I want you to do is have a taste of that barley. Share them with your friends there. It's a nice, delicious snack. It's a good bar snack. Just pop a couple into your mouth and have a chew. And what you'll get is a nice malty, sugary sweetness. Now the boys, when they're drying the barley, one of the signals for them when they know that it's dry enough to be able, that, uh, for them back in the day, I mean, they're using, they're using uh, gauges now to measure the, 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 uh, the moisture content. But back in the day, once it's dry enough, they could write their name on the, on the ground with it. They would know that that's, now it's time for us to be able to start making whiskey with that, all right? But you get a nice malty, sugary sweetness, and then, and then, you're getting the smoke from that. So that peat that I was burning earlier, that's where that comes from. Now, the peat on Isla is more decomposed seaweed as opposed to the peat in the highlands is more decomposed pine trees. So it's kind of like the difference between sitting on a campfire on the beach versus sitting on a campfire uh, on the, uh, in, the, in the forest. We are on the beach. So we then take the barley, we grind it into a fine grist. It's got the consistency of a mucilix. And then we add hot water to it. We mash it. Uh, we then take the liquid out of this. It's called wort and then take it to our next step, which is fermentation. Sound familiar? Basically, we're making beer. At Lafroy, we produce uh, a million liters of smoky beer a week, but then we distill it down to 80,000 liters of spirit. So once it's been fermenting, and we have some of the longest fermentation times uh, in the industry, 90 hours long, we then take this uh, beer, and then uh, we are now going to distill. With distillation, we boil the alcohol. The vapors are trapped by the condensers. We distill twice in Scotland, one of the differences between the Scots and the Irish, the Irish triple distill. We feel like we get it right after the second time. Sorry. <laughs> Actually, that's not true anymore, because there is an Irish distillery that uh, we're owned by Jim Beam, that, uh, the Cooley Distilleries, and they double distill. So they, they're, they're following our lead. Um, and it comes off the still as a clear spirit. Um, next, please. So here, the, as we saw before, these are the wash stills here. Um, where the beer goes in, and you, you can just see here, there's a, it looks like a little window, a sight glass. So think about if you're boiling beer, what's going to happen? It's going to froth up. So when you charge this still, and it starts to froth up, 
the stillman sees it at that window, he knows now it's time to turn it down. Some of the distilleries have got uh, tennis balls on a rope that they, they don't have the window, but they just bang the, the column here and they can hear where the, where the foam is working its way up so they know when to turn it down. So we distill it up uh, to 25% alcohol of, uh, by volume at this, uh, in the wash stills. Now at this point, there's still some rather nasty byproducts. There's some acetones and some acetates, which back in the day, if you made a bad batch of whiskey, you ran the risk of going blind from drinking. It's where the term blind drunk comes from. So we need to distill it one more time. So we send it on to our spirit stills. And the great thing, the unique thing for us with our spirit stills are they're some of the smallest stills in Scotland. One of the contributing factors to a flavor profile is the size and shape of the stills. The taller the stills, you're going to get a lighter, sweeter style. Think Glen Morangy. Uh, they have some of the tallest stills. They're designed after old gin stills. We have very small squat stills. So you get a heavier, oilier body. And that will, it, literally, that oilier body will cling to you more. So um, you'll, after we taste this, you're not going to taste any other. You're not going to be able to taste anything else over there after we're done because it's just going to stick with you. And that's all about it. But so these, uh, this size are based on the original. When whiskey making was first made legal in 1825, you had to have a 1,000 gallon still. And these are, these 4,000 liter, 1,000 gallon stills are, are the original size of when whiskey making was first made legal. They're not the original stills, but they're the original size. So it comes off the still 63 to 67% alcohol. Perfect now for aging in the barrels. So we send it off into our warehouses. Keep these in mind because when we get into the tasting, which we will do, I promise, um, these will come into play. Uh, this is the American bourbon barrel, uh, 200 liters. A quarter cask, got a 100 liter cask, uh, and the sherry butts at 500. A lot of people think the quarter casks are half the size this way. They're not. What we've done is we've taken staves out. We've gone from 42 staves down to 27 staves. So instead of it being a shorter barrel, it's a narrower barrel, all right? And those are the kind of barrels that we use by the whiskeyman to, to put on a pack horse, one on either side, to bring it to market. So we put them in the barrel, put them in the warehouse, let, them leave, let it leave there, the long sleep, we like to call it, minimum of three years. Uh, but we're tasting whiskeys today that will range from five years to 25 years, okay? Um, and, and let it breathe. But you're going to get an influence. Uh, we talked about the regional influences in Scotland. You get an influence regionally on Isla. The three big boys, oh, you can push it a couple times, are the three along the, the, the bottom here, Lafroig, Lagavul, and Ardbeg. You can go back. Thanks. That's all right. Push again. There we go. Um, and then you go inland, and they're a little bit lighter in style, generally, Bomore and Brookladdy, and you've got Kilcommon. And then up along the, the sound here, you've got Bunahaban and Kalila. Um, the storms come all the way across the Atlantic, all the way from Nova Scotia, and they land right along the southern portion of Isla, right here. So that's, we talk about the climate dictates the style of the spirit. You see that there. This is also Jura here, for those of you who know the, the, the Isle of Jura whiskey, beautiful whiskey. Um, 200 people on that island, uh, one distillery, got to have your distillery, and 5,000 red deer. It's where George Orwell wrote 1984 on Jura there. So, Here's uh, Lafroig, the beautiful hollow by the Broad Bay. Now, we have a big festival every uh, summer, which we're going to be tasting from those festival bottlings today. And every year, uh, the boys, we paint the, where the distillery, make it all pretty. And, and uh, the, the, the beach here, uh, they always rake the beach to make it all nice and pristine for when the visitors all come. Well, two summers ago, um, um, we're always on the Tuesday. Every distillery celebrates during the week, and each day is a special day for, each diff uh, for different distilleries. On the Monday, we had 80 mile an hour gale winds, gale force winds. Um, we talk about seaweed and the influence of the seaweed in this whiskey. Um, so this was the day, the Monday, prior to our day on, on Isla. Uh, and you can see the seaweeds being flung out onto the, uh, onto the bank here, next to number, our number one warehouse. Um, and so by the end of the day, here's the beach, OK? Um, just that's about two foot thick of seaweed. So it, it's there, it impregnates everything. The sea, you're, you're very, very, very far from it. So in terms of the history of Isla, there have been people on Isla since 4500 BC, uh, hunter-gatherers. And then the first immigrants came over. We got standing stones from 3500 BC, uh, people living through the Bronze and Iron Age. Uh, and then when St. Columba came across 500 AD, from there, uh, 800 AD, that was the end of the Christian period, and the Vikings came along. Lefroig, the name Lefroig, 
Beautiful hollow by the broad bay, that A-I-G ending, mean that ick, ick sound, means bay, as in Reykjavik. So you get the, inf the Viking influence, uh, the Nordic influence, as well as the Celtic influence in a lot of, uh, a lot of the language there. Um, and then uh, Somerled took over in 1200 AD, the king of Scotland, the lord of the isles, his seat was there on Isla. Um, now, because of uh, 1500 AD, John of Ardnamurchan, uh, the estates were passed on to Sir John Campbell, and you'll see this name repeat quite through the, a lot through the history of Isla. It was uh, the Johnston brothers who were on the mainland of Scotland who were evicted uh, by Clan Campbell and came down to the island of Isla uh, by the uh, early 17th century. They settled in the Kidalton Parish along the south coast where you saw the, on the map there. Um, they founded the distillery in 1815. They got the license to do it legally in 1825. Um, but uh, Donald Johnston, or one of the brothers, he died into a, uh, after falling into a vat of burnt pot ale at the distillery, succumbed to his injuries. So we like to say there's a bit of the Johnston family in every bottle of Laphroaig. Um, his son, Dougal, took over, uh, but he was, wasn't old enough to be able to, uh, really, to legally uh, uh, run the distillery. So it was uh, John Johnston who uh, 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 appointed Walter Graham from the Lagavulin distillery to run uh, Laphroaig. And 1877, Dougal dies. Now, during that time, there was actually another distillery that was built right along the bay there, right by Lefroig, um, the Ardinistiel uh, distillery uh, by the Gardner uh, brothers. Uh, it only lasted for 30, uh, 31 years uh, and then fell into a state of disrepair. And that's where you see the number one warehouse today. Um, so in the Cadalton Parish, it was Sandy Johnston. He was the distiller of the time. With, uh, there was an excise officer. You're talking five people who are running the distillery at this time. Uh, they only had one pot still and one wash still. Uh, but then they continued to expand. In 1907, Sandy dies. Uh, and it was Ian Hunter then takes it over in 1908. He expanded it from two to four stills. Uh, he terminated the partnership with the, with the Mackies of Lagavulin because the, they wanted to share our water, um, uh, our water source. Now, for those of you that don't know, every distillery has its own water source. During the summers, historically, we would shut down for what we call silent season. We don't have enough water to make whiskey. So the boys would go work the fields until the rains came, and then they could start making whiskey again. Now, the folks at Lagavulin, they're asking to share the water. How are you going to do that when we're already limited with the water capabilities? And that's still to this day. It's still an ongoing issue in terms of water availability. If we don't have the water, if it doesn't rain, we can't make the whiskey. Um, it was Mr. Ian Hunter who really grew and expanded uh, the whole footprint of Lefroy globally. Um, these are the boys in 1934, um, and that's Mr. Hunter there in the cap. Uh, it hasn't really changed much through the years in terms of uh, the workforce now. There is... Um, oh, oh, so, um, so during this time, we, we did very well. Certainly, Prohibition helped us a great deal. But um, the, the, then World War II came, and Sir Winston Churchill, um, you can see 1941, there were 71, uh, 72 distilleries, 1942, 44 distilleries that were up and running, and in 1944, zero distilleries. They shut them all down. So when uh, the war was done, it was Sir Winston Churchill who uh, got them up and running again because he felt that it was a dollar maker of uh, inestimable value. And that, was, that is one of the reasons we are doing as well as we're doing today uh, in the whiskey industry. Uh, he was a bit of a drinker himself. Uh, he did enjoy his whiskey along with his cigars. Um, there was a, a, a famous instance where uh, there was a, 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 gen, a, 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 a woman by the name of Bessie Braddock uh, who had come up to him because he was known to be a bit of a tippler. He said to him, sir, you are drunk. And Mr. Uh, Sir Winston Churchill responded back to her, Madam, you are ugly. Tomorrow morning, I will be sober. <laughs> so um, he was uh, quite, quite the politician there. Um, Bessie Williamson, uh, she came to be a distillery, uh, to be a secretary to Mr. Uh, Hunter back in the 1930s. She became a, um, a director in 1950, managing director in 1954. Um, she then, in 1967, sold uh, Lefroy to, to Long John, so that's when it really came out of the family and started uh, uh, being corporately owned. Um, 
They also expanded from four to five stills. The great thing about Bessie Williams is that she is the only female distillery manager owner in Scotland in the 20th century. So we will definitely raise a glass to her this evening. Today we have Mr. John Campbell, a man, a man of the island, an Eloch, and we're going to be tasting one of those, uh, those, those whiskeys today. It's called Eloch. Um, he used to be a lobster fisherman with his brother off the, off the coast, decided to come, come to the land and start making beer and making whiskey. You have to make good beer before you can make good whiskey. And we make great beer at Laphroaig, right? Um, oh, look at this. We're, now we're, okay, so let's taste some whiskey, shall we? Um, I thought what we would do is uh, start with uh, a very unique whiskey for us. The Isla, um, the Isla Whiskey Festival every year does a special festival of bottlings. And um, they're one-offs, very limited. And this is the Isla Festival bottling from 2011, the Eloch edition, the Islander. This is in tribute to Mr. John Campbell. Um, so that's the first one on the left. If you would like to um, pick that one up there, have a nose of that. Now, first of all, um, nose into the glass. None of this mamby-pamby waving about. Get your nose into the glass, but part your lips. I'll demonstrate like this. The other side of the room. And switch nostrils, not with your neighbor, but from one to the other, uh, because one nostril does tend to be better than the other. Um, and this is an eight-year-old. This came from 38 Maker's Mark bourbon barrels. We use Maker's Mark bourbon barrels at Laphroaig. And this was all, this is all the liquid came from 38 Maker's Mark bourbon barrels. This is an eight-year-old. Now, we're going to have a toast, and we'll have a taste. And as you're tasting, here's, a, here's another tip. The tendency we sip, we sip at the front of the mouth. Where else would you sip, right? But what you're getting at the front of the mouth is not only the sweet, which is fine, but you're also getting the heat. The alcohol sensors in the front part of your mouth. So when we go to taste this, I'm going to ask you to place it more towards the middle of the tongue. This way it bypasses the heat sensors. You get more of the flavor, less of the burn. These glasses, these Riedel glasses, what they're doing is depositing the spirit middle of the tongue rather than the front. So here's the toast. May the best you've ever seen be the worst you'll ever see. May a moose never leave your pantry with a teardrop in his e. May you all be hale and hearty till you're old enough to die. May I wish you all the best as I wish you all to be. Slanja, cheers. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Oh, that is mother's milk. Oh, oh you don't know my mother. <laughs> There's that smoke, yes? All right, you taste it in the barley, you smelled it in the peat. Here we are. Now, this is an eight-year-old. Uh, this one is at 50%, uh, 52%, uh, sorry. This is pretty high. So, uh, in regards to water, uh, a lot of folks, a lot of times they add water to it and they add too much water, and now you've got, too, you've got watery whiskey or whiskery water, whichever you want to think of it. So, one of the things I like to recommend, rather than adding water directly to it, what I'm going to ask you to do is add it, mix it, marry it in your mouth. So everybody's got water, yes? Yeah. So uh, we're going to try another sip of this if you haven't finished it all already. Um, so we'll have a sip of water. Hold the water in your mouth. While it's still in your mouth, have a sip of the whiskey. Hold the two. Ready? So, and hold them there for a while and swirl them around. Water? Hmm. Now, what would you think of that? Getting different notes, different flavors from this. You get a lot more of the sweetness. Some orange, you're getting some orange than that. So, and the great thing about this is right now you still have your, your whiskey neat if you prefer it better that way, right? So this is, this is the Karchus, the Eloch edition. Uh, this is very limited. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go, the next one we're going to move to is triple wood. Yeah, that's good. Leave it there. So triple wood is used as a combination. The three barrels, do you guys, uh, folks who know quarter cask? Quarter cask, we're aging in a 200 liter bourbon, and then we put it into a 100 liter bourbon. You saw the quarter casks earlier. This is just a shot of me on my way to school. That's uh, with my quarter casks to bribe my teacher. Always got good grades. Um, but those, so those, that's just a, so then what we do with triple wood is after we've been aging in the 200 liter bourbon, then the 100 liter bourbon, we put it into Oloroso sherry casks. So have a nose of this one here. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, the second one. 
We're backing off on the smoke with this one, yes? And this is the sherry influence. So here's the toast, all right? We're using sherry uh, from Jerez, uh, the bodegas of, of Jerez in Spain. We have a relationship with Harvey's uh, bodegas. So here's the toast. Saluda, dinero, amor, el tiempo para conquista la toro. I'm not sure what I said there, but hopefully I said health, wealth, love, and the time to conquer all, or if I said it wrong, I said time to conquer the bull. So <laughs> pick, pick your toast. <laughs> Cheers. Slanja, Lafroy, Triple Wood. Mouthfeel different, yes? Get it more along the sides. Tends to move up into the, up into the roof a, a wee bit more. You enjoying that one? This one really backs off. The longer in the bowel, you're getting more the influence of the wood or the more touches of wood. So if we change it, if we put it into another bowel, you're going you're gonna to again lose some more of that smoke. So you're getting a lot less of the smoke with this one here with the triple wood. Uh, beautiful whiskey. This started in Europe, uh, duty free. We, uh, we launched it there and we brought some over to the US last year. Small allocations. We're continuing to grow this brand. I'm hoping within the next year or so we should have this as a standard bottling for us within this expression. I find a lot of, um, a lot of Macallan drinkers enjoy this because of the influence. A lot of wine drinkers enjoy this because of the influence of the grape. All right. And sherry. Sherry was what, what was used predominantly prior to Prohibition. Uh, Post-Prohibition, uh, suddenly there was a lot of good American bourbon wood because uh, the, there was a law that went into effect that said you can only use a bourbon barrel once here in America. I thought it was a congressman with a vested interest in the timber industry, but actually it was American Cooper Union, the barrel makers. They want to make sure there was work for themselves, so they mandated it, stuck ever since. Perfect for us in Scotland because we don't want to use a brand new barrel, too many tannins in the wood, to, so send them over to us, we will reuse them. But prior to that, we were using predominantly sherry. The sherry was coming up from Spain in the casks. Once the casks were emptied, we'll just refill them. But the thing, tricky thing with sherry is that the sherry casks is that it can really impact greatly whatever you put into those barrels. It's a real balancing act. You have to be very careful because it can overpower. So that's triple wood. Um, I'm actually calling an audible here. Uh, we're going to go. We'll go to the next one here. Uh, what I'd like to taste is Laphroaig 18 year. So uh, on the tasting mat, that's the second from the, uh, the right. So 18 years in the barrel, really backed off on the smoke. You're losing 2% evaporation every year. We call that the angel share, right? So you lost 36% of the original volume. That's why the older whiskeys are priced higher. Now there's another way of nosing the whiskies. You go into the warehouse, you want to get a sample out of the barrel, you have what's known as a copper dog or a copper thief, a long copper tube. In the wine business they call it a wine thief, a valanche, right? So what you do is you uh, pull the bung of the bung hole, insert the copper dog, draw off your sample, put it into your glass. But if you don't have a copper dog, the other way nosing the whiskey is this. You put your hand over the opening of the barrel and roll the barrel a wee bit. So put your hand over the opening of your barrel of 18 year old, get a good seal on it, and that's right, roll it. Get your palm wet, get the palm wet. There you go, the wetter the better, right? Okay, so palm wet, glass down, and rub your hands together. Get some heat going, some friction going. What this does is it burns off the alcohol, releases the esters, burns off the congeners. Get them nice and hot. Open the doors to the warehouse. Open that barrel, and welcome to Lafroig. You get more of the wood notes that way, right? Much more of the sweetness. Now, you also notice that it evaporates very quickly. If we were to do this with a cognac, your hands would be very sticky from the sugars. But all the sugars are consumed during fermentation. So another good reason for drinking the single malts. No bad sugar hangover. No carbohydrates, so it's Atkins friendly. It's good for diabetics. Cured of the swine flu. And it is gluten free. Okay, <laughs> now. If any of you are driving, please, please wash your hands. I do not want to be responsible for a night in jail. Honest officer, I was just rubbing it on my body, you know. The, <laughs> the guy in the little green skirt told me to do it, you know. All right, so let's have a toast. This is to the 18-year-old. Willie brewed a peck of malt. 
And Robin Allen came to pray. Three blither hearts that leeling night you won't have found in Christendy. Ah, we're not foo, we're not that foo, just a drop in our e. The cock may crawl and the day may daw, but we'll still drink our barley brie. Now, for those of you who didn't understand a word of what I just said, I'll translate, go something like this. Willie brewed some damn fine scotch, and Robin Allen came to taste it. Once uncorked, the friends confess, not a drop will be wasted. Ah, we're not drunk, we're not that drunk, just a little tipsy. The day may dawn, work may call, but we'll still drink our whiskey. <laughs> Slangeva, Lafroy, 18 year. Whereas the younger Lafroigs tend to be big and muscular and robust, there's an elegance to this whiskey. I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads here. You liking this one here? Uh, now, I, there are other folks who say, no, I love my 10 year. Just because it's older doesn't necessarily mean it's better for you. Okay? Um, there's something to say, something to be said about youth. Um, and certainly, but this is a beautiful whiskey. Our, um, our, our stillmen, when they're working the stills, they're always using hydrometers to check the, the, uh, the, the spirit as it's going through what we call the, the, the spirit run. You have the head, the heart, and the tails. The head is the first part of the distillation run. That's too strong. That's no good for us. So we send it back to be redistilled. Um, and then you have the, the, the heart of the run, which is 63 to 67% alcohol, perfect for aging the barrel. So that goes to the barrels, uh, to the filling stair, store to go into the barrels. And then you've got the tails, which are too weak and no good. So we send that back to be redistilled. But the stillman, when he's in the still house, he's using these gauges, but also uh, he's go, he works by sound and by, by nose. And when you get to the heart of the run in the still house, you start getting these sweet pear notes at our distillery. He know we're in the heart of the run now. You start getting some of these pear notes with this, uh, with this whiskey at 18 years, where it's really pared away a lot of that, that smoke and the big, big salty style, and you're getting more of the sweetness, and there's almost fruit notes to this. Beautiful whiskey, 18 years. Mm. Can we go back? Yeah, let's go. Then we'll go one more. Okay, so um, now we're going to go taste another one from the Isla Festival. Karchus. Karchus means hospitality, friendship in the Gaelic language. Uh, it's, uh, it's pronounced Karchus, just the way it's spelled, right? And, just, uh, it's, uh, um, and this is to celebrate um, origin, the Friends of Laphroaig. Do we have official Friends of Laphroaig here? Fantastic. Now, for all the other folks who don't know about that, what the Friends of Laphroaig are is when you purchase a bottle in every tube, there's a brochure. Don't throw that brochure away. It's got tasting notes and everything, but on the back page is a code. You put that code in, and then we're going to send you a certificate making you the proud landowner of a square foot of land on the island of Isla. So you come to visit your plot. We'll put you in a pair of welly boots. I've got up on my table up there. It's not, we don't have just the one pair. But, um, and uh, give you a flag from your country and shove you out into the field, and you go find your plot and stake your claim for your clan and your country. It's a great program. Keeps in touch with what's going on in the distillery. Plus, I do special events for Friends of Laphroaig. Um, and if the economy tanks here, you know you've got a place to live in Scotland. Uh, there, right? <laughs> So this is the 2012 Festival Bottling. What this is, and you can see here, this is a, um, instead of the, the last carcass we tasted came from uh, the bourbon barrels, this is a mix of different barrels from different years. So 50% seven-year-old Refloig that was aged in a quarter cask exclusively, and there's another 48% that was aged in the 200-liter bourbon barrels for 13 to 17 years. And then on top of that, we threw in two 21-year Oloroso sherry butts of Lafroig. So, let's have a nose of this one. It's almost, you can almost hear the pipes. <laughs> <laughs> Takes you right there. So, and here's, here's the toast. Karchus, friendship. There are many ships that sail the sea, but the best ships are friendships. So here's from Lafroig to the Slanja. Cheers. Now, because of this range of whiskies here, this is, it starts a little tight because of the alcohol. It will continue to open up. Uh, you get the youthfulness of it, but then you're getting some of the sweetness of the sherry casks with this. This is a, this is a lovely whiskey. Uh, there's a lot, of different, a lot of different ages of whiskey in this bottling. 
And so each taste, you're going to taste, you're going to get different layers of this spirit. Um, now, 2013, there will be a new bottling for the Isla Festival. Um, and I'm told, uh, I, I haven't tasted it yet, but uh, I'm told that it's pink in color um, because it's been aged, uh, we've used uh, some, port, some port pipes that it's been aged in. All right, we're going to move on to, go two there. Right, we've got one more for you to taste. And this is Laphroaig 25 year. 25 years in the barrel, we've lost 50% of the original volume to the angel share, right? The happiest angels in the world are over this distillery here. Um, the nose on this one, now we're really backing off on the smoke. The, the, the smoke will come much, much later in the finish, about 2 o'clock tomorrow in the afternoon. You'll go, oh, oh, there's that finish to that Laphroaig 25 year there. Um, but, uh, and what I want you to do with this one, when we sip this, I want you to just let it linger on your tongue for a few five, seven seconds. And here's the toast. This is what my grandfather taught me. It goes like this. Here's to us, ne like us, God dent. And that translates to here's to us. There's nobody else like us. God damn the rest. <laughs> Slanja. Let it sit there. You enjoying that one there? Now, this is 40% uh, sherry cask, 60% bourbon. And what I mean by that is we're aging 25 years in a sherry cask. So at the same time, we're aging 25 years in bourbon. And then we marry those barrels, and it's 40% sherry cask Laphroaig and 60% bourbon cask Laphroaig. Okay? Um, beautiful whiskey. A little bit more limited. You know, uh, you're going to find our, our standards, our 10-year and our quarter casks. You're, there's more of that, but uh, what we've tasted here really are the Isla Rare whiskeys, um, and uh, I think there's a, a great selection for me to be able to taste these and see the variation even within each distillery there. Um, and here are friends of Laphroaig. Uh, we've got 50,000 friends of Laphroaig in the U.S. I think, that, I, think I need to change that number. Uh, but the, here's our, 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 our distillery staff. Total staff at Laphroaig is 30 people. It only takes five men to make it, but we're making it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 46 weeks out of the year. But as a friend of Lafroy, they're the boots that you're going to put, all right? And then, and then we'll shove you out into the field, and there you go. You go try and find your plot. Now, for those of you who are directionally challenged and you have a hard time because you have to pace it off, uh, we, you, we GPS it so you can find <laughs> out exactly where your plot is. Um, uh, so we invited two, two, year, two summers ago that we had a gathering of friends of Lafroy. Um, we invited as many people to come to Isla to celebrate with us, um, and 300 people showed up. That's 10% of the population of Isla. Um, and we all went out to the field and got photographs of them on their plots, and then we all spelled out F-O-L for Friends of Laphroaig. Uh, the O group were a little rowdy. They'd had a little more Laphroaig than the others. For a while, it looked like F-U-L. I was like, no, no, that's the wrong, <laughs> it's the wrong message. Come together. We're friends. You know? But also, there was, um, there was a gentleman from the Pacific Northwest who... Um, uh, was a lifelong friend of Laphroaig who had passed away the year prior and one of his wishes were that his ashes be spread over his plot. So uh, we carried, I carried his ashes across and we spread them on his plot and raised the glass to him and, and, and to his spirit. Um, you were fine. Um, so uh, it is about the beautiful hollow by the broad bay. Um, it is also about uh, the handcrafted nature, you know, the 30, 30 men and women who work at Laphroaig. Uh, it is about the peat, what I like to call the, that blue smoke, the holy smoke. Um, it is also uh, Prince Charles' favorite whiskey. It is the only distillery to have the royal warrant um, in Scotland. It is his favorite whiskey. So I guess by default, it's, uh, it's Camilla's favorite whiskey. Uh, a, actually, I think that's why he drinks it. Uh, uh, <laughs> you notice you haven't seen any naked photographs of her. That's, uh, the, um, oh, sorry. Not that. Um, <laughs> But it's, it's all about good health. Slanja, slanja va, good health to you. Um, uh, and, and I want to send you off into the evening. Um, it, it rains a lot in Scotland, um, so we get a lot of rainbows. The, 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 the rainbow, the pot of gold, the end of that rainbow is Laphroaig. But enjoy the rest of the evening and take this with you. Take this whiskey. And uh, that's all right. It's all empty. That's it. Of all the money that e'er I spent, I spent it in good company. 
And of all the harm that e'er I've done, Alas, I've done to none but me, And all I've done for want of wit, To memory now I cannot recall. So fill to me the parting glass, Good night and joy be with you all. Of all the comrades that e'er I'd had, They're sorry for my going away. And of all the sweethearts that e'er I'd had, They'd wished me one more day to stay. But since it falls unto my lot, That I should rise and you should not, I will gently rise and I'll softly call, Good night and joy be with you all. Good night and joy be with you all. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Have a great evening. Enjoy. Come by the Lafroy table. Slanja. Cheers. <laughs>